Hello everybody, it's me, Mr. Macaluso. Today, we're going to talk about Book 22 of The Odyssey. If you don't have your book handy, I want you to press pause and go grab it. Also get yourself a pen and a notebook, because you're going to want to take some notes here. At the end of the lecture, I am going to post a series of questions that you're going to answer in paragraph form. Okay, now the answers aren't going to be very simple. You're going to have to think about it. But if you haven't paid attention, played, paid close attention to this lecture, you're probably not going to do very well in your responses. So hit pause, grab your book, grab your notebook, grab a pen, and come on back. Welcome back, everyone. So we're talking about book 22, which is subtitled Slaughter in the Hall. And it's just that. We're going to have a bloody, bloody scene in the Hall of Odysseus. Uh, in a lot of ways, this is the climax of the book. Um, when we started reading about Telemachus, you were probably a little bit enraged by the way those suitors were treating him, right? Uh, a bunch of liars, a bunch of scoundrels, people that you really shouldn't trust, people who say one thing and do something else, right? No one likes people like that, true? So um, we've seen a lot of bad behavior amongst these suitors, and now they're going to get their comeuppance, which we've all been waiting for. However, I am going to not just talk about those details. I'm going to talk about some of the larger issues I see at work here. Um, so this book is not just about killing the suitors. It's also about purifying Odysseus's home and I would say his entire realm. Okay, so let's uh, move forward, shall we? Um, so it is a climax, as I say. Odysseus has been away for 20 years. He fought 10 years in Troy, and then he spent another 10 years getting home from Troy, right? Imagine how you would feel when you finally got home to Ithaca, a land you have not seen for 20 years. You know that your son, or you hope that your son will be here, and that he will be a fully grown man, right? Uh, you've been longing for your wife, right? Sure, Odysseus has had some, some fun times with a couple of goddesses, but he was always weeping profusely because he missed Penelope so much. And now he's back. I don't know about you, but I would rush home and uh, give that girl a kiss, right? Give my son a pat on the head. I would want to see them, okay? But, of course, Odysseus the great tactician, is wary. <clears throat> now, do you all know what the word wary is? Think of the word beware, okay? So wary just means that you are uh, fearful that something bad is going to happen. And Odysseus is, this is really where his wisdom comes from, I think, right? He's always a little bit wary of what might happen next, okay? So I want to back up a little bit. We, had, we didn't have you read this book, which is fine, but I want to book. I want to back up to book thirteen, uh, which is called Ithaca at Last. Okay, now in book thirteen, Odysseus ends telling his tales to the Phaeacians, and the Phaeacians then give him all sorts of loot and put him on a ship, and they take him back to Ithaca. When they get there, Odysseus is asleep. So the Phaeacians land Odysseus while he sleeps. They unload his treasure. And Odysseus wakes up, and he has no idea where he is. Okay, Now, he's been gone a long time, but uh, the goddess Athena has a hand in this. She has laid a mist around the island so he can't recognize anything. Uh, and then she appears to Odysseus in the guise of a shepherd. Right? And um, Odysseus wakes up, he's groggy, he meets this shepherd, this very uh, handsome young shepherd, and the shepherd tells him that he is in fact in Ithaca, right? So imagine that, like he just wakes up. Does that remind you of anything? Did he just wake up uh, when he got to Phaeacia? Um, so there's something, there's something to that. Uh, in fact, just in the lines before he wakes up, we learn that the Phaeacians are being punished for helping Odysseus by Poseidon, and their island is being closed off to the rest of the world forever. 
I don't want to talk about that too much, but you should think about that, right? Remember my last lecture, I talked about Phaeacia being this kind of dreamy place, uh, this place where no one else goes except for the gods, uh, and now that place is basically walled off to the rest of the world. There's something interesting there, but I don't want to talk about that today. Um, what is Odysseus's reaction uh, when this, this innocent shepherd, remember, a shepherd is kind of really, really on the low end of society. Uh, here is the long lost king of Ithaca and a shepherd boy says, hey, you're in Ithaca. And his reaction, what do you think it is? Anyone want to take a guess? What do you think Odysseus is going to do? That's right. He is going to lie. <laughs> uh, so I'm quoting from page 295. You can, you can turn there if you want. This is book 13. It says, Ithaca, heart racing. He, that's Odysseus, stood on native ground at last, and he replied with winging words to Pallas Athena. Remember, winging words are words that fly through the air and strike home, right? Almost like a spear winging its way into someone's throat. With winging words to Pallas Athena, not with a word of truth. He choked it back, always invoking the cunning in his heart. So here he is, he's talking to a goddess, and he... Just like that, on instinct, he is lying. Now, earlier I said, we don't like people who say one thing and do another, right? But we do like Odysseus. Because, remember, Odysseus is always uh, trying to get at some greater good through all this. Now, I'm not saying that it's good for leaders to lie. I don't think that's true at all. So it's something we have to really consider about uh, Odysseus. Is he as great as... Homer makes him out to be, considering that he uses, uh, you know, lies all the time to get what he wants. So that is kind of a conundrum that you're going to have to have to think about. Anyway, he lies to Athena, and Athena uh, doesn't bother her at all. As his story ended, goddess Athena, gray eyes gleaming, broke into a smile and stroked him with her hand, and now she appeared a woman beautiful, tall, and skilled at weaving lovely things. Her, note the word weaving. We've, I've mentioned this before. People have mentioned this before. When you tell a story, what are you doing? You're weaving things in and out, right? So that's kind of part of the, the metaphor here, that uh, Athena and Odysseus and Penelope, by the way, are all good at weaving. Uh, her words went flying straight toward Odysseus. In other words, she had winging words as well. Any man, any god who met you would have to be some champion lying cheat to get past you for all round craft and guile. You terrible man, foxy, ingenious, never tired of twists and tricks. So not even here on native soil would you give up those wily tales that warm the cockles of your heart. Come, enough of this now. We're both old hands at the art of intrigue. Here among mortal men, you are far the best at tactics, spinning yarns. Again, there's that kind of weaving metaphor. And I am famous among the gods for wisdom, cunning wiles too. Right? So note all the, the words there. She clearly likes Odysseus, right? You know, she calls him a terrible man, but foxy, ingenious, never tired of twists and tricks. So this is all like, oh, you, you terrible guy, you with your stories, right? Um, and she basically says, like, you and I are two peas in a pod, right? You love telling wily tales, and I, um, you know, I'm famous among the gods for wisdom and cunning wiles, too. Okay, so right away, Odysseus is going to, uh, you know, realize that maybe he's in a tricky situation and start spinning tales. Okay, now let's think about this. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's think about Odysseus and Agamemnon. When was the last time Odysseus saw Agamemnon? Hmm? Uh, you might recall that my last lecture was a lecture on Odysseus traveling down to the house of death, right? And who does he see there? Among others, he sees Agamemnon, right? And Agamemnon is not happy. What has brought Agamemnon down to the house of death? Well, as we learned over and over and over again in the first five books, in the Telemachus, uh, we learned that Agamemnon has been killed 
uh, upon his return home by his wife and her lover, okay? Killed with an ax, remember? And his wife, as he lay dying, the woman with the dog's eyes would not close his eyes for him as he descended into Hades. Uh, Agamemnon is not a happy shade down in Hades. And Odysseus is not one to forget that lesson. So he knows that when he gets home, he should beware that there might be someone laying in wait. Now, his, his mother has told him that Penelope has been true, but Odysseus, he, I think, is going to want to test her. All right? So when Odysseus gets to Ithaca, the idea is he is going to figure out who is loyal and who is not. Right? Um, uh, I want you also to think back to book one of the Iliad. Do you remember how that started? Uh, begin, muse, when the two first broke and clashed. Brilliant Achilles and Agamemnon, lord of men. Right, so remember that book? That was such a heady, heady opening to this epic, right? Um, Agamemnon, how is he acting as a king? If Odysseus is the man of twists and turns, what is Agamemnon? Is he a guy who really thinks things through and has a strategy that's well thought out, well designed to um, get what he wants? I don't think you can really find any example of that. Not in book one, not later on when he says he has a dream that we should all go home and all the men run. Uh, no, Agamemnon, he is, uh, you know, even though he's the head king, he doesn't seem very well qualified to that, right? He flies off the handle. He gets angry. When a kid, when the priest, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Calchas or was it? No, it wasn't Calchas. It was Chryses. Chry uh, when he says like, hey, can I have my daughter back, please? I am a priest of Apollo. Please give me my daughter back. Agamemnon's reaction. It is not tactful, as we would say about Odysseus. It is just outright hostile. Right? He basically sends the man packing, uh, and the man is the priest of Apollo, and of course, he's going to pray to Apollo, and Apollo is going to reply to Agamemnon by sending the plague. Okay, That, of course, gets Achilles angry. Achilles stands up to Agamemnon in council in front of all the other Greek kings, and he says, you know, uh, most you know, selfish man alive, you know, you never do any of the fighting. I'm always out there fighting, and you get all the all the loot. And Agamemnon again loses it, right? Remember, there was no joy in his heart. His heart brimmed with anger, and Agamemnon basically uh, knocks his best warrior out of the war for the next 23 books. <laughs> nice move, Agamemnon. Good work. Right, so Agamemnon is uh, what, what would the word? He's uh, he's choleric. He is um, rash, okay, and uh, therefore it brings on a lot of trouble for him. Right, I mean, you know, think about how many people die because Agamemnon, uh, or uh, maybe that's not the right way of looking at it. Think about how much longer the war goes on because Agamemnon is basically foolish. Okay, so Odysseus is not going to make that mistake. He is going to be clever. Um, and he, in my opinion, is there to seek justice. Now, this is the Bronze Age we're talking about. Uh, the conception of justice in the Bronze Age is not our conception of justice, okay? I mean, let's face it. These guys are kings. They lord it over everyone else. They are, in many ways, terrible, terrible people, right? They kidnap women. They rape women, they kill people for fun, they're thieves, they're pirates. But in the context of the Bronze Age, Odysseus is seeking justice, okay? So he's going to take his time to test people's loyalty, right? And, um, you know, interestingly, even though he's a king, Athena puts him in the guise of, uh, like, a beggar, right? And this is the perfect place or the perfect position to really see people's character. Now think about this. Uh, as a poor beggar, you are lowly. You have no protection in the world. People can do what they want to you. 
and he puts himself in that position to see how people will react. Okay, and um, you know this this is kind of clever. And what do we see? Well, we see that um, he has some servants who have been loyal all this time. Uh, and you know who would those servants be? Well, there's a goat herd. We'll talk about it a little bit later on. Who is not very loyal, right? But on the other hand, his his swine herd. That is now, if you didn't understand this, a goat herd obviously takes care care of goats, and a swine herd takes care of pigs. Okay, uh, what does a shepherd take care of? Sheps, sheep. All right. There's also a cow herd. Okay. So Odysseus is basically. I want you to write this down. This is important. Odysseus is trying to get a sense of who has been loyal and who has been treacherous. If he figures all of that out before he starts slaughtering people, then his slaughter can be sure and swift, right? Um, think about this. When you're not sure about someone's loyalty, doesn't that make life hard between you and that person? Imagine trying to reestablish yourself as king, not knowing for sure who you could trust and who you can't trust. So you can look at books 13 through 22 as a way for Odysseus to kind of feel out who are the loyal and who are the treacherous. Okay? And that extends even to his son and his wife. And it certainly also extends to his servants and his um, subjects, okay? So that's what we see in uh, the books leading up to book 22. And then in book 22, we get this very sure and very swift uh, kind of justice going on. <clears throat> okay, so now I want you to take out your... Um, your Odyssey, and turn to page 439, the beginning of book 22, Slaughter in the Hall. Okay, So open up to that page, and let me just read a little bit. This is at the very beginning of the book. Now, stripping back his rags, uh, mind you, Odysseus has just strung the bow. Remember the bow that Mr. Conroy talked about the other day? He's just strung it. He still looks like a beggar. Uh, and so you can imagine the suitors are a bit amazed by all of this, right? But they're still... They're too dumb to realize that it's Odysseus. Now, stripping back his rags, Odysseus, master of craft and battle, vaulted onto the great threshold, gripping his bow and quiver, bristling arrows, and poured his flashing shafts before him. So he just dropped all the shafts, all the arrows at his feet, loose at his feet, and thundered out to all the suitors, Look, your crucial test is finished now at last, but another target's left that no one's hit before. Well, we'll see if I can hit it. Apollo, give me glory. With that, he trained a stabbing arrow on Antinous. Now remember, Antinous is one of the chief bad guys. He's like uh, one of the two. He's like one of the two leaders of the suitors, just lifting a gorgeous, golden, loving cup in his hands. Right. So there's Antinous, who's just about to drink out of this cup, um, just tilting the two-handled goblet back to his lips, about to drain the wine and slaughter the last thing on the suitor's mind. Who could dream that one foe in that crowd of feasters, however great his power, would bring down death on himself and black doom? But Odysseus aimed the shot, Antinous square in the throat, and shot Antinous square in the throat, and the point went stabbing clean through the soft neck and out, and off to the side he pitched, the cup dropped from his grasp as the shaft sank home, and the man's lifeblood came spurting from his nostrils, thick red jets, a sudden thrust of his foot. He kicked away the table. Food showered across the floor, the bread and meat soaked in a swirl of bloody filth. The suitors burst into uproar all throughout the house when they saw their leader down. They leapt from their seats, milling about, desperate, scanning the stone walls, not a shield in sight, no rugged spear to seize. They wheeled on Odysseus, lashing out in fury. Stranger, shooting at men it will cost your life. So they still don't even know that it's Odysseus, right? Now, Odysseus and Telemachus have taken all of the weapons that are hanging around the house. You know, these are, uh, maybe you have some of these in your palatial mansions. You have suits of armor, you have swords, you have, uh, you know, thing, you know, 
uh, spears hanging on the wall. That's what Odysseus's hall looked like, but they've hid them all away in a locked room. Okay, so the suitors are totally unprepared to defend themselves. And let's go back to that scene I just read. Antinous is shot right through the throat, and um, it's it's cinematic, right? He he's got the goblet in his hand. He's just about to drink. The spear comes through his throat. He falls back. His leg kicks out. It knocks over the table, and there he lay in a pool of blood with you know food all around him. What a scene! I mean. You know, I always tell my class, show, don't tell. You know, imagine if Homer just said, and then Odysseus shot Antinous with a spear, or stabbed him with a spear. Boring, right? Instead, we get this cinematic scene, right? Where, I love that, the foot kicks out, right? Like, he's in his death spasm, and his foot kicks out and knocks over a table. I don't know why I do this when his foot kicks out. That's an arm. That's a hand. It's not a foot. But you understand what I'm saying. Okay, now, um... So that begins the slaughter. Uh, on the next page, page 441, we get the other chief baddie, Eurymachus, right? And Eurymachus tries to like save his skin by talking, right? You know, think about this. He's trying to, um, he's trying to smooth talk or sweet talk Odysseus. Who is the greatest sweet talker in the world? Odysseus. Uh, as they say, you cannot BS a BSer. Isn't that what they say? Um, and we'll see that that is true here. So on the top of 441, uh, we get uh, uh, Eurymachus. Only Eurymachus had the breath to venture. If, you, if, if you're truly Odysseus of Ithaca, home at last, you're right to accuse these men of what they've done. So much reckless outrage here in your palace, so much on your lands. But here he lies, quite dead, and he incited it all. Antinous, look, the man who drove us all to crime. Not that he needed marriage, craved it so. He'd bigger game in mind, though Zeus barred his way. He'd lord it over Ithaca's handsome country, king himself, once he'd lain in wait for your son and cut him down. Right, so like, Antinous was going to kill your son. I never wanted to do that. Yeah, sure. Uh, but now he's received the death that he deserves, so spare your own people. Later we'll recoup your costs with the tax laid down upon the land, covering all we ate and drank inside your halls. We'll pay you back, honestly. Right? Now, what do you think Odysseus is going to do here? Is he going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you live. Um, no, he says, no, Eurymachus, not if you paid me all your father's wealth, all you possess now and all that could pour in from the world's end. No, not even then would I stay my hands from slaughter till all you suitors had paid for all your crimes. Now, life or death, your choice. Fight me or flee. If you hope to escape your sudden bloody doom, I doubt one man in the lot will save his skin. His men have shook their knees, right? So they're shaking in their shoes, their hearts too. But Eurymachus spoke again, now to the suitors. Friends, this man will never restrain his hand. Invisible hands, let's get him right? Uh, brave talk, top of 442. He drew his two-edged sword, bronze, honed for the kill, and hurled himself at the king with a raw, savage cry. In the same breath that Odysseus loosed an arrow, ripping his breast beside the nipple so hard it lodged in the man's liver. The Greeks really love going after the liver, right? Remember when, uh, when, uh, who was it? Hector's mom was like, I want to eat Achilles' liver raw. You know, they, they like liver. What can I say? It's got a lot of iron in it, so it's healthy. It's good for you. Um, uh, out, of, out of his grasp, the sword dropped to the ground. Over his table, head over heels, he tumbled, doubled up, flinging his food and his two-handled cup across the floor. He smashed the ground with his forehead, boom, writhing in pain, both feet flailing out, and his high seat tottered. The mist of death came swirling down his eyes. Again, very cinematic. If I were a movie director and I was going to kill some bad guy, this is a great way to do it. You know, he drops the cup, the food goes flying across the table. Um, it's really, it's just, you know, if you're into gruesome deaths, you know, this is pretty good. Um, now, next, we get to um, father and son battling out 
battling it out together. Uh, Telemachus kind of jumps into it now. And um, uh, he runs up to his father. This is line uh, 105 on page 442. Um, uh, actually, let's go a little bit above that. Um, and, uh, this, is, this is line 95. Amphinimus rushed the king in all his glory, charging him face to face, a slashing sword drawn. If only he could force him clear of the doorway now. But Telemachus, too quick, stabbed the man from behind, plunging his bronze spear between the so suitor's shoulders. And straight on through his chest, the point came jutting out. Down he went with a thud. His forehead slammed the ground. There's a lot of forehead slamming the ground here. Telemachus swerved aside, leaving his long spear shaft lodged in Amphinimus, fearing some suitor just might lunge in from behind as he tugged the shaft, impale him with a sword or hack him down, crouched over the corpse. He went on the run, reached his father at once, and halting right beside him, let fly, Father, now we'll get you a shield and a pair of spears, a helmet of solid bronze to fit your temples. I'll arm myself on the way back and hand out arms to the swine herd. Arm the cowherd, too. We'd better fight equipped. Run, fetch them, the wily captain urged, while I've got arrows left to defend me. So Telemach uh, Telemachus goes, and he gets some more weapons for the, for the loyal um, uh, swine herd and the cow herd. Um, yet, as he does that, uh, he makes a little bit of a mistake, right, which we're going to see. So Telemachus comes back with the weapons and the helmets, and um, if we go to page 444, uh, line 151, um, we see that uh, Telemachus has made a mistake. So let me read. With that, the goat herd. Now remember, the goat herd, he's the bad guy. He is, his name is Melanthius. Uh, and Melanthius is a really bad, treacherous servant. So the goat herd clambered up through smoke ducks high on the wall and scurried into Odysseus's storeroom. So in other words, uh, Odysseus and Telemachus had hid all of the weapons in a storeroom. Telemachus, uh, go, Telemachus goes and gets those weapons for, or some of the weapons for Odysseus and the other two. But when he comes out, uh, or, or now the goat herd is going into the same room, okay? Um, so he's climbing up the wall and he's scurrying into Odysseus's uh Storeroom. Now, what does the word scurry remind you of? Scurry. Would Odysseus scurry? No. Odysseus is not a mouse. Mice scurry. Odysseus is a lion. Lions do not scurry. Okay, but this goat herd, uh, this treacherous, treasonous goat herd, he scurries. Um, bundled a dozen shields, as many spears and helmets, ridged with horsehair crests, and loaded with these, rushed back down to the suitors, quickly issued arms. Odysseus's knees shook. So even Odysseus is a little shaken here, right? Like, oh no, now there's more of them and they all have weapons. His heart too shook. When he saw them buckling on their armor, brandishing long spears, here was a battle looming, well he knew. He turned at once to Telemachus, warnings flying. A bad break in the fight, my boy. One of the women's tipped the odds against us, or could it be the goat herd? My fault, father, the cool, clear prince replied. The blame's all mine. That snug door to the vault, I left it ajar. They've kept a better watch than I. Go, you may shut the door to the storeroom. Check and see if it's one of the women's tricks. Um, so, I mean, that's interesting, right? Uh, who's the great warrior? Odysseus is. Uh, Telemachus still inexperienced. He makes, he makes what could be a fatal mistake. Um, but what does he do? He admits it, right? And he deals with the situation, right? Um, in fact, the line is this. Uh, he says, it's the cool, clear prince who, who admits to that, right? Um, now, uh, the, the two other servants, Eumaeus, who is the uh, the swine herd and the cow herd, they decide, hey, let's go get the goat herd. Uh, and they ask Odysseus, should we kill him or should we just um, capture him? And Odysseus says, just capture him for now, right? Um, so, and, and here's what he says. He says, Odysseus, master of tactics 
answered briskly, I and the prince will keep these brazen suitors crammed in the hall for all their battle fury. You two wrench Melanthius's arms and legs behind him, fling him down in the storeroom, lash his back to a plank, and strap a twisted cable fast to the scoundrel's body. Hoist him up a column until he hits the rafters. Let him dangle in agony, still alive, for a good long time. That's the bottom of 444, 445. So they're going to just tie him up and hang him from the ceiling and deal with him later. <clears throat> um, okay, so there, uh, there we have it. And now the battle continues on. Um, and, uh, you know, as you can probably guess, uh, Odysseus is going to prevail here. Okay, um, now, on page 448, uh, towards the bottom, we, um, the tide of battle is turning in favor of Odysseus, and we get this interesting Homeric simile. Now, we haven't talked about Homeric similes in a long time, and you know that I can't pass it up, so I have to read it. This is line 315. Uh, the attackers, and the attackers here are Odysseus, uh, Telemachus, and the uh, goat, uh, swine and goat herds, herders. The attackers struck like eagles, crook-clawed, hook-beaked, swooping down from a mountain ridge to hairy smaller birds that skim across the flat land, cringing under the clouds, but the eagles plunge in fury, rip their lives out, hopeless, never a chance of flight or rescue, and people love the sport. So the attackers routed suitors headlong down the hall, wheeling into the slaughter, slashing left and right, and grisly screams broke from skulls cracked open, the whole floor awash with blood. Now, uh, did you notice that little interjection there? And people love the sport. He's talking about watching eagles uh, rip into, you know, smaller birds. And he says, you know, people love to watch that. I don't know. Do you love to watch it? I mean, one time I saw an eagle and an osprey fight it out in midair. And uh, it was pretty cool, I have to say. Uh, an osprey came out of, uh, I, was, I was floating down a river, and an osprey caught a fish, started, you know, flying out of the river with it, and an eagle just came from out of nowhere and just nailed the thing. The osprey dropped the fish, and the eagle caught the fish in midair. It was it was one of the cooler things I've ever seen, and um, so I guess you could say like, yeah, I loved it. You know, would I really love watching Odysseus just destroy all these human beings? Hmm, maybe not, but you never know. Now, next on page four forty nine, something interesting happens. Uh, we get a prophet, and now this is a prophet, a priest who's been hanging around the hall with the suitors. And he sees what's going on. He sees that Odysseus is clearly um, winning. And he comes running up to Odysseus. This is at the very top of 449. Uh, I don't know, line 325. He flung himself at Odysseus, clutched his knees, crying out to the king with his sudden winging prayer. I hug your knees, Odysseus. Mercy, spare my life. Never, I swear, did I harass any woman in your house. Never a word, a gesture, nothing, no. I tried to restrain the suitors, whoever did such things. They wouldn't listen, keep their hands to themselves, so reckless. So they earned their shameful fate. But I was just their prophet. My hands are clean, and I'm to die their death. Look at the thanks I get for years of service. Now, it's a prophet. It's a priest. What do you think Odysseus is going to do? Well, a killing look, and the wry soldier answered. Only a priest, a prophet for this mob, you say. How hard you must have prayed in my own house that the heady day of my return would never dawn. My dear wife would be yours, would bear your children. For that, there's no escape from ruling death. You die. And snatching up in one powerful hand a sword left on the ground, uh, Aegeus had dropped it when he fell. Odysseus hacked the prophet square across the neck, and the praying head went tumbling in the dust. Isn't that lovely? Now, I'm not really sure how Odysseus knows that this was a bad dude, right? But uh, in the very next uh, thing that we see is the bard. Now, you all know what a bard is, don't you? The bard is the guy who just entertains the feasters, right? He sings. He's like Homer. Now, do you think Odysseus is going to kill the bard? Do you think Homer is going to make a bard 
uh, a bad guy? Well, he doesn't. Um, so next, uh, now one was left, trying still to escape black death, death uh, Femius, Terpus's son, the bard who always performed among the suitors, they forced the man to sing. There he stood, backing into the side door, still clutching his ringing lyre in his hands, his mind in turmoil, torn. What should he do? Steal from the hall and crouch at the altar stone of Zeus, who guards the court, where time and again Odysseus and Laretes burn the long thighs of oxen, or throw himself on the master's mercy, clasp his knees. That was the better way, or so it struck him. Yes, grasp the knees of Laretes' royal son. And so, cradling his hollow lyre, he laid it on the ground between the mixing bowl and the silver-studded throne, then rushed up to Odysseus, yes, and clutched his knees, singing out to his king with a stirring winged prayer. Uh, and in the end, Telemachus says, hey, he's cool. And Odysseus says, all right, all right, fool, I'll let you live, right? And so, um, again, we, we haven't really seen the backstory of these two, <clears throat> but it's pretty clear from Homer's narration that the wicked was killed and the good was saved. Okay, and in fact, at the top of, um, I think it's 451, he says as much, right? Um, he says, so you can take it to heart and tell the next man too. Clearly doing good puts doing bad to shame. Now leave the palace, he says to the bard. Go and sit outside, out in the courtyard, clear of the slaughter. You and the bard, with all his many songs, wait till I've done some household chores that call for my attention. Okay, so it was the bard and some other guy who got um, who got spared. Uh, I forget. I think it was um, it was some other servant. Okay. Um, now the very next thing that we have to deal with is um, the rest of the household staff. And that would be mainly all of the maids, all of the women. So let's go to 451. Um, and first, let's look at the foul mess that Odysseus has created by killing all these people. Here is another very rich Homeric simile. Page 451, line 405. Odysseus scanned his house to see if any man still skulked alive, still hoped to avoid black death. But he found them one and all in blood and dust, great hulls of them down and out like fish that fishermen drag from the churning gray surf in looped and coiling nets and fling ashore on a sweeping hook of beach. Some noble catch heaped on the sand, twitching, lusting for fresh salt sea, but the sun god hammers down and burns their lives out. So the suitors lay in heaps, corpse covering corpse, at last, the seasoned fighter turned to his son. Telemachus, go call the old nurse here. I must tell her all that's on my mind. So think about that. The suitors, what do they look like? What's this simile? They look like a net filled with fi a fishing net filled with uh, dying fish flopping on the shore. Right? That's quite a vivid image. Yes, quite a vivid image indeed. Um, and uh, he says to his son, go get the nurse. Now, I don't know if, I don't think you've read, maybe you have. Um, the nurse has been loyal, right? And Odysseus has already kind of had interactions with the nurse. And he says, now go get her. Um, and here at the bottom of 451, we have a scene that is reminiscent of the scene in which Hector goes back to Troy to meet his lovely wife. Um, remember that scene where he's got his helmet on and he's just covered in blood and guts and his wife has their son, and the son is afraid. And Hector, for the one and only time in the entire Iliad, takes off the flashing helmet. And what does he reveal? A human being. This is reminiscent because, not, not necessarily because Odysseus is taking off his helmet, but Odysseus is just covered in filth, blood, and guts. So let's read it. 421, on page 451. Chris command that left the old nurse hushed. She spread the doors to the well-constructed hall, slipped out in haste, and the prince led her on. She found Odysseus in the thick of slaughtered corpses, splattered with bloody filth, like a lion that's devoured some ox of the field and lopes home, covered with blood. His chest streaked, both jaws glistening, dripping red, a sight to strike terror. 
So Odysseus looked now, splattered with gore, his thighs, his fighting hands, and she, when she saw the corpses, all the pooling blood, was about to lift a cry of triumph. Here was a great exploit. Look! But the soldier held her back and checked her zeal with warnings winging home. Rejoice in your heart, old woman. Peace. No cries of triumph now. It's unholy to glory over the bodies of the dead. So think about that in terms of Hector. Here is Odysseus returning to his home, but what is he doing in his home? He's laying waste. He's destroying all of the suitors. Hector comes from the battlefield home, and he's covered in gore, like that loping lion who comes home covered in blood. Here, Odysseus, he comes in, and then he kills everyone. So it's kind of a reversal of what's going on with Hector. Okay, now... Next, uh, Odysseus is going to ask the nurse to bring out all of the treacherous maids, right? And, you know, he, she says, like, oh, there's only about a dozen of them, the sluts. Uh, you know, they, they basically were having sex with the suitors all along, and they are treating Penelope and Telemachus not very well. And so uh, here's Odysseus's plan. He gets those treacherous women to clean up the hall. So think about what this means. These women have been, you know, basically bedding down with the suitors at night. They've been, you know, having having sex at night. And now what do these women have to do? They have to clean up their corpses. They have to scour their blood from the floor. They have to pile them up outside so that they can be buried. That's pretty painful, isn't it? Right? And what do you think is going to happen to them after they have done this? So this is interesting. Odysseus is having them clean his house. And that's what I meant at the very beginning of this when I said Odysseus wants to purify his hall. He's going to get rid of all the people who, who have been defiling the hall. And he is going to make it clean again. And it's these treacherous women who are going to have to do the cleaning. And then once they've done the cleaning, he's going to kill them all. Okay. Now, again, as I said, this is the Bronze Age. This is ugly, right? If this is justice. It's not pretty. He basically hangs them all. And it's a very strange little scene uh, in which he does it. It's, it's actually not all that, that easy to understand. It's at the bottom of 453. He sa it says this. Uh, this is line five, or 491. Um, he says, You sluts, the suitor's whores, with that. Taking a cable used on a dark prowed ship, he coiled it over the roundhouse, lashed it fast to a tall column, hoisting it up so high no toes could touch the ground. Then, as doves or thrushes beating their spread wings against some snare rigged up in thickets, flying in for a cozy nest but a grisly bed receives them, so the women's heads were trapped in a line, nooses yanking their necks up one by one, so all might die a pitiful, ghastly death. They kicked up heels for a little, not for long. <clears throat> okay, so that's pretty terrible. It gets worse. Uh, line 500, <coughs> Melanthius, remember, he's the treacherous goat herd. They hauled him out through the doorway into the court, lopped his nose and ears with a ruthless knife. Can you imagine? Cut your nose off, cut his ears off, tore his genitals out for the dogs to eat raw. I'm sure they let him watch that and in manic fury hacked off hands and feet. Then, once they'd washed their own hands and feet, I mean, <laughs> they hack off his hands and feet, and then they go and uh, wash their own hands and feet. Uh, then, once they'd washed their own hands and feet, they went inside again to join Odysseus. Their work was done with now. But the king turned to devoted Eurycleia, she's the nurse, saying, Bring sulfur, nurse, to scour all this pollution. Bring me fire, too, so I can fumigate the house, and call Penelope here with all her women. Tell all the maids to come back at once. Right? Now, notice that, right? What does he want to do? He wants sulfur to scour all the pollution and fire to fumigate the house. So, here's the way I see this. The house has been defiled by the suitors. That is, they've made it dirty and unclean. He's killed them all, and now he's fumigating, okay? On another level, what has he done to his realm? He has brought about some sort of justice. He's gotten rid of all the bad, 
and he's kept all the good. Now, can he rule as king without worrying about people that he can't trust? He's gotten rid of all those people. Has he set an example for anyone who might be thinking about being bad? I think he has. So there is book 22. Uh, and there we have Odysseus cleaning house. There's only a few more things to be done. And that is his true reunion with his wife and the reunion he will have with his father. Thanks for listening. I hope you understood and hope you got something out of that. Uh, if you have any questions, please have them ready in class on Wednesday.